Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us again today. I'm so happy to have you, and I cannot wait to introduce you to our guest. But before we get started talking, I want to uh, thank some folks that we always thank. We want to thank BrassAndWinds.com, a Quinn the Eskimo company. When we're looking for brass or woodwind instruments, we always call Brass and Winds first. And we would ask that you do the same. They're fantastic folks, and I believe they've just moved to a brand new facility. So give them a call or check them out on the web at www.BrassAndWinds.com. We are Willow Music, uh, formerly Grant Park Academy of the Arts. And we offer online and in-person instruction in piano, in voice, in uh, guitar and ukulele and the drums and the sax and just about anything you can think of. Uh, please check us out at willowschoolga.com. And if you are at all interested in studying on your own, then we have another site called Truer MU, which my controls won't let me get to, but hopefully I'll let you see it in a second. www.truermu.com. <laughs> you can take classes online in jazz improvisation through a series of videos. Let's see, there we go, truermu.com. Check us out over there. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce you to a friend of mine. As you all know, if you follow these uh, interviews, uh, I went to Oberlin College and had a lot of friends who were singers over there. And uh, in one case, I was actually able to perform with one of them. I once in my life had the romantic lead in a musical, <laughs> it never ever happened again. And my partner in crime was Miss Heidi Moss, now Heidi Moss Erickson. And I'm going to introduce you to her right now. Uh, before I let her talk, I'm going to tell you a little about her. Uh, Heidi Moss Erickson is a noted soprano and vocal pedagogue. And she studied at Oberlin College and Conservatory, had a double major. Then she went on to graduate work doing biochemistry at UPenn. She's done private study with Richard Miller and with Stephen Smith, W. Stephen Smith, renowned pedagogues. And uh, there's lots more to tell about her, but first I just want to say hello. It's great to see you again after all these years. Hi, great to see you too after all these years. I know we sort of have kept in touch over the social media, so it feels like we haven't left, but it also feels like it's been a long time. So great to see you. Yes, well, even though we've been in social media, we haven't spoken in uh, 25 years. So this Oh gosh, cool. this dates us, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, well, they can look me up, so they're going to know, I'm afraid. So, <laughs> they're going to know. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, you have an incredible story, and there's so much to tell. Um, I'd like to go back to the beginning. Um, I guess, just let's just tell us how you got here. You, you can go f as far back as you want. Okay, well, I mean, obviously I met you at Oberlin. I went to Oberlin because it's one of the rare schools that has a conservatory of music and a liberal arts college. So anyone out there who's thinking of schools, it's a wonderful place. And so I came from a family, I'm the youngest of six of doctors and scientists. And so I think that was sort of in my DNA to pursue that. So I chose Oberlin because I could do biology and sing at the same time. So that was why I chose Oberlin. And Richard Miller's lab was, I studied with Don Mae, but I did have Richard Miller for one semester, but his lab was really my big draw, uh, the voice science element. Uh, and then to go on, should I go on? Sure, or, well, I was just gonna say that folks yeah. may not know what a big deal Richard Miller is, and you wanna talk, you studied with him and uh, very closely, and I'd like you to tell people why it's important that you worked with Richard Miller. Yeah, so I met him actually the summer before my freshman year. He had a summer institute on voice science, and I was the youngest one there taking his workshops, I think maybe to some of the older teachers' chagrin that they had like a 17-year-old there. And uh, yeah, and I, I was just obsessed with how he saw the voice. I'd never heard anyone describe the voice scientifically, and so he was actually a big pioneer in voice science and using science as a pedagogical tool and the understanding of our instrument to make us better singers. And so um, even though I didn't get to study with him all four years, it was just one of those, I was in his lab as much as I could. And he was always generous in talking to me, even 20 years later when I had my injury, uh, well, maybe it was 15 years, yeah. So he has been a sort of force in my life since Oberlin, been in communication and things like that uh, up until his death in 2009. So I was very lucky to have his mentorship. So you were you gravitated towards him because, of, because as you said, you had a background already before you came to Oberlin in science and there was a science connection there. It, absolutely, I, yes, exactly. I'd never met a musician scientist before. Now, since then, I've met 
fun. So you realize how how similar the fields are when you get into it. But back then, that was like there were two different universes, right? So right, right. Well, uh, yeah, I can't wait to talk more about that. But uh, yeah. you, uh, even though you know you were a you were a wonderful singer even then, and uh, you decided to go to school in science from there on. Yes, parental pressure goes a long way, right? Sorry, mom and dad. Um, yeah, I think it was one of those things. I saw my peers, you know, go off in, in music, <clears throat> and I didn't feel that I was, you know, designed for that kind of career. Uh, and I felt science was sort of what I knew. I knew it in my family, and I knew. So that felt safer. <clears throat> so, uh, and I do have a serendipitous story about that. But yeah, I went off to UPenn and uh, did some graduate work in biochemistry. Yeah, I wanna talk about that. I think the 1999 paper was part of your biochemistry graduate work, is that correct? Uh, it was actually a little post-grad, but yes, yeah, yeah. Let's so talk about this Dr. paper. Keller. Yeah, so I yeah. went to Rockefeller, but I'll tell a quick anecdotal study about Please, Penn. please, go ahead. Because when I was at Penn, I had to, you had to find housing, and uh, there's all these rooms advertised and so forth and so on. So I found this beautiful old house in West Philadelphia and it had an apartment upstairs, just one. And there was a wonderful old man landlord. And one, one day I had, was studying and I heard music downstairs, but I knew it sounded live. And I said, that's weird. You know, I've been here three months in graduate school. And I asked my landlord, I said, did you have like a string quartet downstairs? He said, oh yes, I have a music group. He said, my name is Franklin Zimmerman. If anyone knows Purcell, all of Purcell's works are cataloged by Z numbers. Oh, wow. Because he is the foremost Purcell scholar who ended up serendipitously being my landlord. And I hadn't sung since college at that point. I'd given over and I said, can I sing for you? And he actually let me do some gigs with his group pen pro musica so i felt like that was like fate even though i'm a scientist i don't believe in those things but what's the probability of my landlord being a personal scholar and me being able to get back to singing when in graduate school i thought i'd not sing again so it was a very serendipitous thing and i i credit that experience with actually dangling the carrot saying don't quit yet Heidi don't quit yet <laughs> right. and you went on in 99 to win the leader crans vocal competition yes yeah look at you you're yeah look at you, you know. <laughs> that's pretty cool why don't you tell people what that is so the leader crans was this wonderful organization in in New York City and um they had I, they had this kind of mixture of performances and recitals and it was sort of the start of because I do a lot of leader now um but they had a competition every year. They had a Wagnerian category, which of course I was not in. But it was one of the more prestigious competitions. So it was, um, again, I was a scientist then, and there's something to be said for ignorance is bliss, is not being immersed in a group of competitive singers. I was just, so I could be a little bit more relaxed about competitions and things because I wasn't in the universe of pressure. And so, yeah, so I did well in that. and that sort of started the stacking towards shifting slowly from science to music. It was one of those first things, yeah. Right, but that same year you were involved in that paper with Dr. Jack Griffith, is that correct? Yes, so my mentor was Titi DeLanga at Rockefeller, female scientist, yes, Tila Rose. And Jack Griffith, it was our collaborator, our structure collaborator, collaborator but I was the only one in Titia's lab to do the molecular biology on that paper. And it was sort of a very seminal paper. In, in science, we measure success on um, publication references. So it has, I think, uh, almost three, over 3,000 um, citations right now. Yes, this is a big deal, this paper. It was mentioned in the New York Times. And I actually want to talk to you about it a little because I think it's relevant to the whole discussion. I want people to know exactly what, what this is, just in case it comes in handy later. I'm going to do my best yeah. to explain my understanding of the paper to you, and you can correct me. I'm not oh, a scientist. Oh, look at you. Okay. So I'm going to do my best. I have to remember. It was a long time ago, too. <laughs> I'm going to keep it basic, just so the folks that like science can keep up. Uh, ah. We have chromosomes in our bodies, and the chromosomes carry genetic information, and the chromosomes replicate that information as we grow so that we continue to grow as the same person we were when we started. Am I so far so good? Yes, yeah, so far so good. Here, I'm okay. going to give you an emoji. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we have, there are 
things at the end with what's important with the chromosomes is for them to transmit the information correctly. There's all sorts of possibilities for error. And if they, if there's an error, then we end up the, all sorts of mistakes start to occur in our body. We get sick, things go wrong. We have these things at the end of our chromosomes called telomeres. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Very good. Yeah. And, but, and so the, the telomeres, they do their job. They make sure that the information is transferred correctly, but every time they do their job, a little bit of them goes away. It's a, uh, and the life of each chromosome, the life of the cell, depends on how long that telomere lasts. And Correct. so you were studying how that telomere protects itself. Like, what's it, is that correct? And you guys found yeah. something very interesting about that. Yeah, so there was this, we call it the, the end replication problem, because actually your DNA is getting bombarded with damage constantly. And how it recognizes, you know, UV light, toxins, you know, all sorts of things. So we're actually really well designed to repair our DNA. Of course, we know when the repair isn't great, that's when we get mutations and, and that causes all sorts of things from cancer to, you know, any, a lot of illnesses, um, even neonatal kind of things. Um, anyway, so how this mechanism repairs itself that we're constantly dealing with is through this enzyme that recognizes a straight end, right? So it recognizes a break and that's how it repairs it. It says, uh oh, there's a little break in the DNA. I need to fix that. So we didn't know, science didn't know and textbooks for decades had DNA listed as linear, right? And so scientists were like, well, how does the cell know that that end is not just a break that it needs to correct? What does, what looks different about it? Um, and so what we discovered was that it's not linear, which is what we were taught throughout genetics, is that it is actually a loop at the end. So the DNA is actually looped, so the end is actually tucked in and protected, and that's what allows the cell to not think it needs to repair it. Um, wow. yeah. And the, so the end loop is the identifying thing. Yes, the, yeah, so the loop is what protects it so that the, the repair mechanism doesn't happen. The other side of what you were talking about with telomeres is very important. They, um, every time your DNA duplicates, because the enzyme that replicates it only goes in one direction, that a little tail of that DNA is lost. And so the telomere is actually a repeat. It's just TTAGGG. It's very conserved throughout evolution. And when that runs out, then the cell dies. And I like to tell people that it's good that that happens because what is an eternal cell? Cancer is sort of an example of what, you know, you want a lifespan to your cell because the longer it lives, the more it's prone to damage and other things. So you want a lifespan. Um, so, you know, the, the key that's happening now is what is something that can be, you know, longevity versus a natural lifespan. So that's sort of a hot thing right now. But anyway, so that's that's the two two pronged part of that story. Yeah. And what you all discovered was the looping part, uh, which is an interesting thing for me. There's something about the uh, the loop is some kind of a it, it's an aesthetically pleasing solution to a scientific problem is what I noticed. Yes, I mean, and and it was one of those things that if you throw a you know, my boss would say, like, if we throw a piece of spaghetti on the floor, there's going to be a probability of a loop at some point statistically so when do you know that when you see something it's very hard to study in vivo as we say so most of the studies are in vitro and then you have to so we had to be really 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 sure that what we were seeing wasn't an artifact of just you know splatting dna onto a well, you know a slide and it naturally looping and so we designed experiments to that end to sort of make sure we were seeing something literal and then the proteins that bound to the telomeres it made sense that it was tucked so the story came together that's great well it's clear the way you talk about science that not only are you incredibly knowledgeable but you love it it gets you excited it does. It should, right? Yes. Well, Everyone should be excited. Some people, it scares some people. I, I, yeah. I had a hard time with the sciences myself. And, you know, while I've grown to, to love them more over the years, I can see the hesitancy. But it's fun to see you excited about them and sharing your excitement with them. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, I think passion for anything in life is what motivates you. So, you know. So, but you, you hit this milestone with science and yet your singing career took off. Isn't that correct? That was a crazy year, 19, 2000, yeah, 1999. I had 
published that paper. And at that same year, I, I um, won the New York district of the Met. I actually tanked on the finals. So that's a whole other story, which talks about the psychology of, <laughs> of performing, which did teach me a lot. I always think failure teaches us so much that failure in the finals and uh, oops, I just dropped something. And then also I had an experiment in the lab that I worked on for a year that failed. And those two experiences were my favorite of, of all time. So I do like to tell people that, you know, failure can be a good thing. Well, were they your favorite experiences at the time or only in retrospect? At the time as well, I was proud. The net one, not, maybe not so much. The science experiment I was really proud of because it was just I got a, a negative result. And right. the project itself was was really difficult and really well thought out. And the design I was super proud of. Just getting a negative result, it just didn't, the, the hypothesis I was looking for didn't manifest, which is what we do in science, right? We were hoping for a model that was in yeast that would be in humans, and it wasn't. So there you go. Well, well, a lot of people see auditions as a kind of a, uh, I don't know, either a game or something. Do you see auditions more as scientific experiments? <laughs> oh, gosh, now I do. I think, I think they're, I'm, as you know, now I'm into the neuroscience of it all. And I realize how, you know, I say singing is physics, physiology, and psychology. And the third P is the killer. And that's what killed it for me is, you know, you second guess, you or judgmental of yourself. And as soon as you walk onto that big stage, you know, yeah. you're done if you're doubting, you're done. So that was what I experienced. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, and didn't then, seem to, didn't stop you ultimately, I don't think. No, no, I mean, that was the biggest competition obviously I'd ever advanced to. So, right. you know. And um, you continued to sing though for the next few years. Exactly, yeah. Right. And there is an anecdotal story. I hate to talk about like, you know, I'm, I'm not a big feminist or anything like that, but, the critique I got in science, I was taught, I looked young at that time for my age. And so in science, I was always told when I had to present to look mature, you know, so I had long blonde hair, I'd put it back up and I'd wear glasses and I'd wear a business suit and I would talk with a little lower voice. So the people took me seriously, which is sad for women. Now being out of singing, Jen Litwin could have coached me on this. I could have used her help. I assumed the same for singing. So I went out there in the Met competition with my suit and my hair up. And then the bit, one of the critiques I got, because they, they talk to you after, that's one of the great things about the Met, is how I looked. Mm -hmm. And they said, I didn't look my fach. I looked, I dressed too mature. I was, you know, a light coloratura and I should have. So that was sort of disappointing that that was the first thing out of their mouths was... Right. an appearance thing it's like what about my singing but anyway that's a that's a whole other can of worms that women deal with in both fields yeah, there's yeah. disparate judgment over females in science and females in performing so it was well, i agree that it's unfortunate but it's also fortunate that you shared this story because anybody that these things are still in play today and now and yeah anyone that has any interest in auditioning needs to know that these kinds of things are going to be a part of their thought process and that it's worthwhile to give thought to who you're performing for and what their thought process might be. And if they're going to be jerks, you might prepare for that. Exactly. Yeah, not everyone thinks like that, but you have to prepare for the people that do. And people want to visualize what you're going to perform as. So that I didn't make that calculation at the time because I was in a field where they were telling me the opposite, you know. Right, right. That is a very interesting story. Yeah. So we're about to come upon the most profound um, moment of your life here. Uh, okay. Could you set it up for us? So I was very fortunate in singing during this time. That 1999 year was a big turning point. And I actually was, um, even because I was in the Met, Met uh, competition, they had a summer program that I was uh, invited to be Susanna Noce di Figaro. So that I was able to take a leave of absence for three months. And it was just a dream come true. I mean, to play that role in Italy with Met Young Artists was just unbelievable. Um, met so many people, learned so much. And so I took the leap. Um, I had to visualize what my career was. I was going to be a young mother, too, at the time. So it was like, could I get a lab job and be, you know, it's 70 hour, 60 hour work week, or should I just sing and teach? And, you know, so I decided to take the leap and uh, leave the lab. And it was a very sad thing, but try to pursue singing more. And I moved to San Francisco and 
had my baby and was performing and singing and teaching. And then I came down when I was pregnant with my second child. Um, I had actually gotten a contract at SFO and things were just taking off. Uh, I got hit with uh, Bell's palsy, which was seemed mild at the time. Uh, and everyone was like, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And uh, three months later, I had no improvement. And I went to my neurologist, they gave me an MRI. And I just remember walking into that room and just seeing, you know, the blank face and him saying, you know, you have the complete destruction of all your facial nerves. And, you know, I'm so sorry, there's nothing we can do. Uh, and so that hit me really hard, obviously. And I, at the time, I couldn't talk very well. I mean, obviously, the physical vanity issue. Um, so there were just so many psychological components in addition to the physical that that just happened overnight. It was literally overnight my life changed. And yeah. so, yeah. What I remember reading as I did a little preparation, uh, you mentioned yeah. something that there's only there's 40,000 cases of Bell's palsy a year and uh, only 1% of them are severe. So that's only about 400 people that have to deal with the most severe. And you're one of those 400 people. Yeah. And you're probably, you could, you could be the only singer. <laughs> yes. I found one other singer because obviously I was fascinated by, you know, I, because it's so rare, even SLP, speech language pathologists or doctors don't quite know how to rehabilitate a singer, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not something they're used to doing. Uh, who's relies on their voice and their face because there is a seventh cranial nerve. It's not just facial expression. There's one, there's muscles in the neck. There's one muscle in the larynx called the digastric, which is a suprahyoid muscle that raises the larynx. So it makes my larynx asymmetrical. So there were vocal problems as well as articulator problems and no one, you know, no one could help me. So the rarity, but I did, there was a, a, a singer named Act, Axel Schutz, who was a leader singer in the 20s and 30s, who had it as well. And he, there's not much, he did write a ped book that I own, but he became, he was a tenor, famous tenor. And when he, he didn't sing much after his injury, but he became a baritone. That was the one piece of information that I found that it lowered his voice. Oh. So that was the one anecdotal thing. That's good. Well, this uh, put a crimp in your vocal work, didn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, there's nothing like being told you can't do something though that, you know, cause I, I was told by my neurologist to not expect anything, you know? Um, and then even the, my closest, you know, colleagues, you know, the vanity part of our art form is so important. If you can't emote with your face, you know, so you have to have somebody really take a leap to cast you over someone else. So I, it took, so I had about two, a year, two years where I couldn't, couldn't sing at all. Yeah. Um, where I even just avoided it. It was like, you know, depression. I had a new baby. So that, that distracted me. I, well, but, I have a question about that and you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but yeah. um, there's an, our art does two things for us. First, it allows us to uh, reach people. Whereas we, we may, you know, it's a chance for us to connect with an audience and with other people and express ourselves. But the art also gives us an opportunity to present ourselves the way we want to be, to protect ourselves. The art, we, we actually, we can learn skills to control the way we are seen. And you, you didn't just lose your art, you lost your ability to do that. Uh, was that for you part of the issue? Yes, I, I... <sighs> I said at one point, you know, our faces are our identity. We, we forget that in our daily life, but it's our ability to communicate with other people emotionally. It's our sense of self. It's, uh, there's so much vested in, in just a face. And um, so I think that, that element hit me harder than I realized. I also had a two-year-old in addition to my newborn, and you read about babies and their mother's facial expressions and the importance of that and the thing that killed me is she would say mommy why are you so angry and i wasn't angry it's just that i had this you know i look like this and so she couldn't see my facial expressions that she had been spending to you so i was worried about the psychological impact on her yeah. as you know being raised with this kind of confusion when she's just developing her emotional and facial recognition even my newborn, I, I this is what sort of, I would have to say started me on the neuroscience journey because I was researching 
papers on facial expressions in babies, you know, and the science of that, because I didn't know how there was no research on how this would affect my newborn who's learning about facial recognition and my two-year-old who was also doing the same at a different stage. Um, Can so I that offer okay. something right here? And I want to ask you a question about this. In my studies of babies and their parents' faces, one of the things I found out was that the babies, even at a very, the very beginning, babies are watching their parents' faces and they are not fooled by TV screens with their, there's an actual mirroring going on where they are actually connecting with you via facial expression. And so, yes, yes you're in an interesting position. Of course, I would Im imagine that as long as there's a genuine communication going back and forth, that the baby and the mom will adapt, but maybe that isn't the case. Is that what happened for you? Yeah, I mean, I found that they adapted really, I mean, I worked hard on it to verbal, you know, do a lot more vocal emotion expression with my youngest, who was the, um, the one who, you know, I was the default imprinter and she's totally fine, you know, <laughs> she's very emotive and so it didn't impact her. But I did make, I did change things. I taught, I, you know, I used movement and gesture and vocalization. My older one, I think it did confuse her. And I think there was some not lasting, but definitely lasting in terms of she still wants to check in on my emotional state. Like she still is sometimes get, you know, are you okay? Are you, you know, I'm like, I'm fine. You know, so I think that ambiguity stayed with her mm -hmm. about not being able to figure me out as easily as she could. So I wonder about that. A lot because that was a key imprinting stage um yeah it's interesting you, you got lots of stuff to work with here oh god i was handed a smorgasbord it's like <laughs> pick one <laughs> yeah well i mean it it's great. fortunate so your science background has actually saved you in a way it's helped you to move forward through is what did you do because you are a you are a singer again and an amazing singer again so how did you do that Ah, yeah. Again, it's like reading paper, the skill. One thing about my lab that I don't know if it, I think now in hindsight, it was unique is, is Titi DeLonga, my mentor. I was in that lab for almost, like, almost eight years, a long time. Um, we had to read papers voraciously and pay, we had to do a journal club in our field as well as something outside our field. And I realized that was sort of unusual, but that process made me not scared of any science it may get it reduced the fear so if there's a paper that is unfamiliar unfamiliar terms it doesn't scare me because i was doing that for eight years and so looking up neuroscience papers on mother infant facial expressions or how vocalization is signaled from the brain right so because the downstream my muscles were all so i'll also say something about facial paralysis for the first the f facial nerve starts sort of above your ear and branches into about 7,000 nerves. Now, in most cases, a, belt, a nerve has, is like a wire, right? It has a wire and then a plastic coating. So it has an axon and a myelin sheath. Most cases of Bell's palsy, why they heal is because the axon, the wire is okay, but the myelin sheath dies. So then when the myelin sheath regrows, the path is all there, they look fine. So that's what most cases are. My case, both the wire and the myelin sheath died way up high. So at the, the point of origin, I had complete death. Nerves regrow like half a millimeter to a millimeter a day. So you can measure how long that takes. And it was about two years, a year and a half, two years that I had no facial function. So complete droop. But once they regrow, they have no path. So they regrew randomly. So what happened was my face now, like you can see, if I try to smile, my eye closes because my brain, the nerve that's supposed to go here, ended up going here. And that happens all over. So I can't raise my eyebrow, not because there's no muscle function, it's because there's random firing and it just pulls and it's all active. Anyway, so how I retrained was like, I had to find parallels of loss of muscle signal and how the brain can signal that. And the weirdest thing was I was directed towards a, um, a colleague of mine who was in science towards phantom limb patients. And that field of, you know, people who lose a limb in war, but still sense it and still feel pain 
was sort of the gateway to what thought, how they train those people. They do mirror therapy and they also do thought. And so that was sort of how I started to think about if I think about a sound, how can I execute it? And that was sort of how it started slowly. And you had some interesting help from your old uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Richard Miller, who actually ended up changing some of his ideas. He, yeah. I, I um, did some reading. I read Dr. Miller's book and knew Dr. Yeah. Miller at Italy, and he was very uh, opinionated, to say the least. Uh, had very strong opinions on what he thought good singing was, and he, you know, he produced some wonderful students. But you could also see there may be room for him to uh, open up a little, and I think he may have contributed to that. Yeah, that was a lovely exchange. I have the emails. I think I posted them on Facebook too about the email exchange because it was something I had seen in his lab in college. And one of the things was that he would talk about this lift. You know, UC Bjorling would lift the cheeks and, um, you know, you get higher resonances if you lift the cheeks. And I wrote him, I said, you know, Richard, I can't lift my cheeks, but can you listen to me and can you hear the resonance? And that started a flood of exchange between the two of us. And he said, you know what, Heidi, it's never been proven directly. You know, we say in science all the time, correlation isn't causation, right? That's sort of a real, and I think there was a correlation, but perhaps the causation was something else, which subsequently I've been researching, and now there's all sorts of studies on, you know, why this helps. I have two theories. One is people who are over dropping the jaw. If you lift, you sort of change that vocal tract, you know, shape. So the other thing is even I did an experiment with bass trombonists, you would like this, where if they think a happy thought while they're playing, the upper harmonics will ping. So there's some, and then the other flip side of that is if people are depressed and they actively smile, they'll start physically feeling happy again. So there's this circle of happy and high harmonics across cultures that's been researched in words too, words that have more, even if they make nonsense words, for example, that have a lot of E sounds in them, people will think they're happy. If they have a lot of O sounds in them, people will think they're sad, regardless of, you know. So. I think that that is why people observe high harmonics with the lift is because there's this neuro imprinting of high harmonics and happiness and joy and that kind of thing. I'm thinking about words that, that mean happy in uh, our romance languages, happy, feliz, yes. yeah. I'm wondering if that's a coincidence and sorrow. Yeah. And I, hmm. Right. I mean, linguists have a lot a lot out there but there are really good papers on, and that's something else i've you know it's in my huge pile of papers <laughs> when i was trying to figure out the why right because people were saying oh it's related to the levator palate it's related to the soft palate there is no neurological connection between the cheeks and the soft palate none right so there's no wiring that's connected but that's what people were assuming um anyway so that was so yeah <laughs> There are functional connections between all sorts of different parts of our bodies that may not be connected directly uh, by wiring. Right. So it may be hard to see scientifically, but functionally it can be explained. If your toe is broken, it can definitely affect the carriage of your head. For yes. Instance, so. No, that's true. And But I think what I'm saying is like I was able to do it without cheek function. So, yeah. so what does that say? If I think joy, and then I did this experiment, on, if I just think joy... I get that ping or, you know, so it's, it's that idea. Let me offer this to you too, just from my Feldenkrais background. Oh yeah. One of the things we learned in our training and had ample opportunity to demonstrate that it is that a movement that is thought rather than actually carried out, if you think it clearly enough, it actually provides superior function from the, actually the doing of it. And as with phantom limbs, even if you've lost the limb, if you can envision its use, you can still get the benefit of whatever movement you might have lost from the loss, loss of the limb. Absolutely. And that in singing, that's even more imprinted because we are what's called a vocal learner, where the audiation step actually, they did this great, I call it the sleeping bird experiment. They put little electrodes on a syrinx of a bird. And if they think, if they're played their song, their syrinx is activated. And we're very similar. I, I yeah. teach singers with audiation that our motor cortex is 
activated if you think of what you want to sing or what you want to say. So it goes be you know, it's true for all motor elements, but even more so for vocalization. Well, you segued us into birds and you love birds. I do. Well, yeah, I like thinking about birds. I don't know if I love them as like, you know, I want to hold one and snuggle it, but you'd like to take them apart and look at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd like to look at their brains in picture well, only. <laughs> so I've learned a lot from listening to your podcast and finding out what you know about birds. And you, you've talked about something surprising. Speaking of non-direct connections between things, you know, we think of ourselves as basically primate descendants. And yet we have a connection with birds that we don't have with chimpanzees. Exactly. This is another one of those, you know, life is full of serendipity. So when I was at Rockefeller, um, it's a very small institution, actually. And so you sort of know all the PIs, the principal investigators, and there's always there's talks all the time that you go to outside your field. And so there was a very famous neuro, bird neuroscience lab there, Nottenbaum. And uh, I remember going back when I was, you know, a scientist and him giving this talk on the neuroscience of vocalization in birds. And at the time I was like, huh, you know, what does this have to do with any, you know, how can a bird, which is such a different species from us, teach us anything about ourselves? Like I just, it was cool as a singer to hear the talk, but I was just not convinced because I wasn't a neuroscientist and it wasn't my field. And I just was like, okay. But then years down the line, um, when this came about, those papers started turning up in some of my searches. And there uh, was a postdoc in his lab, Eric Jarvis, who then got his own lab at Rockefeller, who revolutionized and made the correlation between human brains and bird brains. And then I had another con colleague, Indre Viscontis, who is a neuroscientist and a singer. She's a superhuman. Um, who also started talking about Eric Jarvis's work. So he discovered basically, um, if you look at sharks and dolphins, for example, they look alike, right? But they're, one's a fish, one's a mammal. There's something called convergent evolution where it's not a direct path, but the, the characteristic is useful enough that if it happens randomly, it persists because it's become useful evolutionarily. And so what happened in evolution serendipitously, like a lot of things in birds and in humans, is that our motor, uh, all animals, even from you know reptiles to humans, have a vocal ability and a limb motor ability, right? We each have those things. What vocal learning did was there was a duplication in the motor pathway randomly for limbs that then was right next to the vocalization and then they started cross wiring right and so what vocal learning is is the ability to mimic and modify vocalizations deeply and that's what songbirds have that's what we have and there's parallels in structure and genes and the overlap is insane and chimpanzees don't have that for example does language acquisition, which comes later in a person's development, does that um, make vocal, does that enhance vocal learning or does that throw a monkey wrench into it? So language acquisition, it's all the same process, right? When you look at how a bird learns its song and how a baby learns its language, it's, you know, small patterns and repetition and experimentation through hearing, right? The audiation step. And so... Um, language ac acquisition doesn't suppress that ability because we're always learning. When they talk about how it's harder to learn a language later in life, um, I think that's actually a good question. Ooh, you made me think a little bit. I think what it has to do with, I'm obsessed right now with articulator signaling and there's something about that motor, it's really complicated how our articulators signal to form phonemes. And there is even things called like linguistic neutrals, like where your tongue is. Your tongue can never be relaxed or you'll die, but every language sort of has a neutral and then everything else is calculated based on that neutral. And because there's such precision in language maybe, that that's much harder to undo because of the precision that is learned. That's my guess.
I'm also thinking uh, babies don't generally start to talk for real, most of them, until they're about three or, you know, three or years old or so. However, they can understand language far earlier than that. Um, so, but there's a mismatch here, right? Okay, so they are comprehending sounds that they are hearing for a language purpose. Yes. Right? But they're not, the, the, the vocal impersonations they're doing have nothing to do with language for three years. So you've got right. this vocal learner thing, which has nothing to do with language. And then yeah. you have a language thing, which is happening, and that they don't converge until they're three. Yeah, I think that you could say that they are contiguous. The, the different, they're, they're both, if you go through the brain, there's like Wernicke's, which is the comprehension, and then Broca, which is the premotor. The coordination to vocalize is so complex that I think that it's like they can't walk, right? They, they you know, there's this kind of you know, baby giraffe, you know, we also talk about the third tri, you know, fourth trimester and things that babies are born earlier than other mammals. But um, I think it's honestly this motor coordination. I think the, the complex, it's over a hundred muscles required to vocalize and their brains are really capable at comprehension, but motor execution is just, it's difficult. So, yeah, yes. that's a great answer. I think I understand what you're talking about. It's yeah. and it's refined. It's not not only is it refined, but it's not visible to us. Uh, right. To do, we rely so much on what we can see to adjust our bodies. You want to tie your shoe. You look at your hands. There's nothing to see here. It's all got to be visualized. So right. that yeah. definitely want, that would in, increase the tendency for delay. I would think. Yes, and I think that there's their motor imprinting as they hear. It's just that those connections to equate an auditory signal. I mean, I, I think even about, I mean, you can make applications to singing. I'm sure beginning singers hear what how they want to sound, right? They, they have, you know, they want to sound like, you know, I don't know, Josh Groban or, you know, Mariah <laughs> Carey. Or, and they can hear that, you know, they just can't execute it. So it's, it's that difference between comprehension, audiation, auditory processing versus execution. And execution is such a leap in terms of ability. Um, and it's one of the things that makes vocal pedagogy very difficult. Uh, yes. Yeah. And, um, and I just lost my train of thought. But it's, it All makes right. vocal pedagogy difficult. Um, well, I'm going to leave it there. Yes. I mean, vocal ped... It's a complicated thing because I get very strong opinions and then I change my mind or I have a great colleague who changes my mind and I'll give a shout out to Dr. Ian Howell at New England Conservatory who said to me once, you know, because we have very, everyone has very sort of interesting discussions and he said, some lies are true. And it sort of goes back to your, you know, the metaphor kind of um idea and imagery because we can't see it right what you were saying is we can't see it so these other things were born to give us a way of thinking about it so yeah i'm trying my i really want the holy grail though i do believe that we can make singers better faster and i think we need to mix up the apple cart a little bit and that's what i'm trying to do and i've seen results in my students through these kinds of new ideas in a way that I wasn't teach, taught before in my entire life. And so, uh, and there is an analogy, analogy, there's this book I'm reading by a neuroscientist um, who's doing the same for neuroscience. It's sort of like outside in versus inside out. I talk about upstream, downstream and singing. Uh, and we've been so focused on the mechanism and designing things to, to deal with the mechanism. And that's not how we're wired. You know, that's not how we're wired. So can we find a balance between tweaking the mechanism deliberately versus then doing something that's much more biologically relevant? You said something in one of your, either was either a podcast or an interview that challenged me. And I want to give you a chance to continue to challenge me, or maybe we can <laughs> find a way to, to come to an agreement on this. Uh, on the piano side, I've had tremendous difficulties throughout my life becoming the pianist I needed to be. And uh, for me, um, the development long delayed of my reading skills was oh. tremendously helpful in becoming the pianist I needed to be. And what, what's interesting was that, um, and I've, as a public school music educator, you know, there's a disparity between those who want to teach reading and who want reading to come later. Uh, now you 
pointed out that you you were of the opinion that uh, reading was in. A, I don't want to say a detriment to singing, but the singers are different animals when it comes to reading. And I want you to elaborate on that. Yes, um, reading is extremely important and extremely useful. I think singers should actually all learn piano, and that should be their gateway to reading. Mm. Uh, and I think that's where, I think actually it's great for all instrumentalists to maybe learn piano. I mean, that was my first instrument. I actually minored it in my freshman year and then I dropped out because <laughs> it was too much. You know, college's piano is very different from, <laughs> so anyway, I don't know. Yeah, that, that killed my piano career. Um, we need another interview but, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I had, yeah. I don't even remember her name. I was so traumatized. She was the Russian piano teacher. I think I know who that was, yeah. We'll yes, we won't say her name. <laughs> we'll <say> her name. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, yeah, so I, th I, so you have to, we have to go for what is useful for music education for learning scores and all that versus what is useful to the instrument and what reading does to the voice is there's so much contradictory information and our brain is not good at what i'd call multitasking or translating and what happens is um and i've had singers now request non-reading lessons where they learn auditorily is that the, the examples i give is intervals are misrepresented in sheet music on the piano they're literal for the voice there's two things well not really but you know what I <laughs> go ahead I'll, i won't contradict you i will contradict you no 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 I'll, I'll just say they're, they're quantal right it's well, quantal on a piano meaning one note represents one note on well, a piano that's, that's the only thing about piano notation that's good the rest of it is a nightmare piano notation yeah. looks nothing like the movement that is required to produce it no, no okay. notation yeah. is a nightmare for all instruments. It's a bad yes. compromise system. Right. Okay. So the, I will agree with you on that then. So I will say where singing is differs from piano, we'll say music notation sucks for everybody. It's not quantal in the voice, first of all. Um, the other thing is that our, it's a, our Western scale is a log scale. So a half step is wider higher than it is lower a piano you don't get that a half step is a half step wherever you are uh but for a singer they don't realize that as they go up an octave that is going to feel harder and wider mm -hmm. psychologically uh so that's the other thing um and are we are just not wired to vocalize that way biologically piano is it is it is already an external instrument voice is a biological instrument and so and then you throw in language right. you have a language part of the palette if you ever look at words underneath a text you're constantly having to translate too much information that the brain does not want because you have three consonants on one note that you know you're going to have to calculate differently you know, um, so there's just too much translating that has to happen between the written page and the, and the vocal page. Registrations, you know, things like that. So although I would argue with you, music notation, it's, it's my husband likes to say, even for composers, it's like, this is just like a roadmap. This isn't the actual literal place, you know, because as I learned a lot, I used to think I have to interpret things so literally, but he's he's like, no, you know, it's 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 a dynamic thing thing living thing yes, so anyways it no it's a it's a remarkable thing and it allows us to uh see pieces in seconds that we'd have to take minutes or even an hour to hear so it's a wonderful right. tool but you but the tool is not a, it's not a natural tool it has to be learned just like mathematics has to be learned it's not uh, a simple process Right, right. And I say for some singers who have, as I said, the three P's, the psychology where they have imprinted music performing anxiety to a certain note in their register. Mm. As soon as they see that note, anxiety inhibits the mechanism. Stress inhibits the mechanism. And so if you take that variable, and now if you have perfect pitch, you're sort of screwed. But even people with perfect pitch, when they don't see it, there's not that 
PTSD trigger anymore. So I've had people afraid of notes, you know, when they see it on the page, and then if they're doing something else and they don't see it, they're fine with that note. So I think there's those kinds of elements, the psychological elements of written music as well, you know. That is fascinating. I'm thinking of all the things that pianists see that depending on your history could freak you out just because of the way they look. Runs, horrible runs of 30 second notes or grace notes. Yes. I'm wondering all, yeah. I'm wondering about yeah. that in my own playing and I'm gonna have to investigate that. That is- weird. Yeah, I mean, for me, I've always had small, I have small hands. So like if, if I were assigned something that had a, you know, that I could see the stretch, I would just, mm -mm, I'm not doing it, you know? Um, <laughs> it's like, no, you know, rather than even just try cause it's context dependent or I could do something else to, you know, it's like, mm -mm. so I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I also find that, uh, if the piano music doesn't look like it sounds, it can really mess you up. Uh, the, you know, they try to save ink by making sure this measure is this wide and this measure is that wide, but they're both the same duration. And exactly. that can cause all kinds of crazy problems, you know, which wouldn't yep. occur if you just had the music in your head. Right. And I would argue for any instrumentalist, getting off the page as soon as possible is a good thing. It's not saying don't learn how to read music. It's not saying don't have that skill. It's just that as soon as you get off the page and you have a mode that motor automated, then the art can happen. You know, I feel, you know, it goes back to multitasking and how we're not good at that. It's just the sooner you're off the page, you're not having a second calculation that even though people can perform beautifully that way, what would happen if you took away that variable, you know? I think people, I just, pro, those people are probably, they've probably integrated the art of reading into their artistry. So it's not multitasking yeah. anymore. It's a part of the whole package for them. I think. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. But I think that's that's rarer than com more common, but. Oh, I agree. It's very difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. You, uh, what's, I find most interesting about you as a vocal pedagogue is that you have had to test your ideas in ways that others haven't. People, their vocal pedagogue, there's a million vocal pedagogues, a million theories about this is how you should sing and that's how you should sing. And you know, maybe it worked for them and maybe it didn't even work for them. Maybe they just like the way it sounds and they can package it. You have had to yeah. test every one of your ideas on yourself and you know they work. Yeah, I think that was the blessing in the curse, right? Is that it's almost like, I, I don't know, sort of maybe a professional athlete getting injured and then starting, having to start, like I started from a place in my head that was more advanced, but my mechanism was beginner, right? And yeah. so, um, yeah, I mean, I think I wouldn't have evolved this way if this didn't happen because I just, the, the pa because the thing is, I always was an insecure singer, uh, a thinky singer, um, where the psychology, like a thinking I had to be right. I have this little monster in my studio that even for the adults, he's all judgment and negative thoughts go to this guy, you know, because I was in coachings where it's like they would, you know, one note would be drilled for an hour, you know, and it's like, and I just realized that is so opposite of what gets people to feel free is how we're taught in this kind of, fix, 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 fix mindset. And how that really destroyed me in a lot of ways. I mean, I had great teachers, I was really lucky, but um, I think it's, we're selecting for people who can be resilient to that, not necessarily selecting for great artists. Yeah. And so we're selecting for resiliency to criticism and fixing rather than creating brilliant artists. That is amazing that you said that. No, yeah. I mean, because people give up. I mean, I've, I've left coaching saying I quit. I mean, my husband's seen it even as a professional, you know, even in the past five years, I've left coaching saying I'm done. I can't do this anymore. You know, because one of, one of the examples was a great coach, love him to death. But we, I was doing Porja more, and there's this, the, oh, mi rendi el mio. There's this, oh, right? And he wanted it this certain dynamic with immediate vibrancy. And that's what we drilled for, like, 
30 minutes. I couldn't do it. I did, and then then you lock up. And then, so then I went home and I listened to like 30 Por Jamors. Not one of them did it. Not one. Kiri, Renee Fleming, you know, Ana Mofo, none of them. So I'm like, why was I being tortured for this amount of time for something that no one else is doing? Why do I have to do it? Because I have to be the vision of what this person thinks the interpretation is. And I just said, this is what's wrong with our field. This is what's wrong with it. Is that I'm not allowed to be an artist. I'm not allowed to make that decision myself. Instead, I'm being criticized because I can't do what this one person wants to hear. Well, and so well, I, yeah. Resi- aren't you developing resilience, resiliency against, yeah, I know. Where's where's the place for there has to be some resiliency. Uh, obviously, oh, someone that, that can't listen to any feedback at all is going to fall on their face the second they get a challenge. So where's the happy medium there? I totally agree with what you're saying. I think it's really brilliant what you're saying. However, devil's advocate, where does the filtering need to occur? I think we can even I think it's first of all, it's like therapist client, there's going to be knowing who you're working with. And, and I have students that want me to whip their ass that like they come in and if I'm not fixing things, they're just like, what, what's wrong, Heidi, you know, and I will verbalize it. I will say, do you want me to be picky right now? Or do you want to just sing? I'm open about what the dynamic is between the two people and what they want in that moment. Do you just want to run it? I also believe musical practice i actually was just talking about this with a student before this interview i was like i want i told him i want he he was too technique focused the past week i said i want you to divide your practice this week into three the first thing you're going to do is run your pieces in the character and the literal text of the piece that's one third of your practice your second third is going to be the technical stuff that you want to work on the third is you're going to play and be crazy and you're gonna move and you're gonna think that you're like a preacher or some sexy cabaret singer. And I want you to explore every sort of which way of every single character that you can. I have these little feelings boxes too that I like pick out and it's like they have to perform. Okay, that's your directive. I don't care if it's (laughs) sad or happy because this is, this is my another favorite one, Reverend. So I think it's like these are directives that our brain is wired to communicate and you will discover things. So. I think we don't do enough of diversity in practice and exploration, and I don't think we do enough gauging an individual. That coach should have seen that I was losing my shit. Pardon my French. Can I? Uh oh. Can you bleep that out? Sure. Okay. I'm not, I'm not going to. Please continue. Okay. Okay. So I, I think we need to be in tune, like the therapist, with our students to know move on. Move on. This is not working you know, distraction, you know, dopamine is the positive neurotransmitter, right? We learn best when that is flowing. If we inhibit that with fear and fight or flight and amygdala, and I have to do this right, you are not going to get progress. So I'm not saying don't give technical directives or don't criticize or don't push your students as far as they can go, but know when it's too much, I think. And we don't do that enough. We don't diversify and we don't know when to stop when someone is on the other side of the spectrum and they're blissing out and no longer paying attention either to their audience or even their own technique, yeah. how, how, how do you bring them back from that? When is it time to draw the reins a little bit? What good does that do? Um, I, I think it's, it's hard to put something qu- concrete on that. I, I did have one coach that in a masterclass setting, as soon as he saw a singer check out, he made the whole room do that. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it. And it was a shock because it just made, it worked though. Yeah, yeah. And so I think if you can develop some signal that keeps them in flow, right? We talk about flow, you know, whether it's a bell or like, you know, I love these kinds of little Pavlovian things, whether you draw a monster or make a monster or get a card or have a snap when you can see your singer or your pianist or your musician, like, going down that it's just like a Pavlovian thing that you trigger rather than having to stop and start all over again. It's like, when I do this, I knew when everyone did this, they saw me like judging or like looking up or, you know, and it it shook me. And then I would get back on track and then I'd see that again and it would get me back on track. 
Did you yeah. think of yourself as a vocal pedagogue of any kind back in the late 90s? Uh, or has this process turned you into one? Yeah, you know, I I admit because I, I started with Richard Miller's summer program it, when I was 17 years old, voice science and pet has been a passion of mine. I actually started collecting historical vocal ped books probably in that time period, late 90s. So I have a huge collection of amazing historical, even unknown vocal ped books. Um, so I'm interested in the history, but I'm also interested in pushing the field forward. Because it's one of those, the difference between vocal ped and, and basic science is that basic science, just like the tea loops, you up you upend a paradigm that everyone's been teaching for decades and everyone's like oh okay this is the new way this is how we look at it with vocal pet it's like garcia said this in the 1800s you know it's like this is fact you see all these people like hugging and it's not we need to be on the shoulders of these great people who preceded us just like you know, I was fortunate to know, oh, I actually think I still have it in here. James Watson, who discovered DNA. Hold on. Oh, yeah. I have this right here. So I used to sing. Now, he's in controversy right now because he got dementia and started saying some things. But he won the Nobel Prize for discovering DNA. And he, I, I was close to him because I presented at a telomere con conference and then was his, he, he, I presented and then I also performed. And so he loved that I was a scientist singer. So he hired me for all of his things and we became close. So I was looking for surgery and I have this letter. He gave, I didn't cash the check, but he had sent me a personal check. Wow. Dr. Wow. Jim, James Watson to help towards my facial paralysis treatments, but I never cashed it. Yeah. So it was very moving. He was a very, but anyway, so how we got from there to the tea loop, people just accept changes but vocal ped they, they don't there's a lot of hanging on to old ideas and i don't know how to shift that well isn't that part and parcel of the whole idea of you can't see it um, because we can't see vocal ped happening it is easier to stay attached to ideas that may not be working you can't see dna either you can see vocal ped much more than you can see molecular things because now we have spectrographs we have eeg we have um we know more about the neuroscience we know i don't know i i think there's that what is science and what is not and people are afraid of science i think and people think that the I, biggest misconception i feel is that people think because i love voice science and science that i'm a thinky teacher when i'm or, or that I teach my singers thinky. And it's actually the opposite. It's the opposite. I teach them to play more, to explore more. I'm a much looser. I know the physiology and all of that, but that's not how I teach. And I, But the understanding of that helps me be a better teacher because I can design, I can trick them. I do a lot of like neuro tricking that they don't even realize I'm doing it. Like people who, you can't say lower your larynx, right? I mean, those are things you can't say. So what do I do? I see a soprano and she's singing Queen of the Night and her larynx goes way up. I have her do this. I just have her go, oh. She doesn't know what I'm doing. And then she goes back up and her, she nails her F, right? So it's stuff like that. I'm not, and I make it fun. I'm like, Oh, you're queen of the night. Oh, and she's like, oh, and it's like, there you go. Go back and sing that F, you know, so you can, you can be into science and not be a thinky teacher, but I think you cannot argue for ignorance. That's what bothers me. I think there's no argument for ignorance. There's no argument for not being curious. There's no argument for saying, I know what I'm doing. I don't need to know that. I want to forever be changed. I have a great colleague, Ken Bozeman, who is an acoustic guy who changed my teaching forever. I mean, I never thought about the things that he describes until I read his stuff. And I want that. I want to be challenged. I want to have my mind changed. I want to learn always from the great people that learn. But those are the people that are learning and exploring. Anyway. No, no, not anyway. This is very relevant. Um, and I'm thinking two things. 
One is that uh, some people are afraid of science because it is a different way of thinking and it is very, um, in a sense, it can be very unforgiving. Uh, you can find out that things are not true or that the current theory disproves your theory and that can be a blow to your ego. And two, there are people I think that are afraid that the science, um, well, maybe three. Two, it can remove the mystery that they so enjoy, uh, that there's this mysterious process and it results in beauty. And three, it can maybe make you dogmatic. You can get caught up in the science. You said that is not a, a pitfall for you, quite the opposite. And yet the fear remains that if I think too much about science, I'm going to get hung up on little tiny details and I'm going to lose the big picture. Yeah. And I think that's the, the thing that needs to be changed because I think once you know the science, it actually frees you. Just like my student, like who I'm making play every week, you know, because he will get better results that way. Um, and I like to argue that science and music are the same because both require a technical foundation and a creative overlay. And I think if you look at it that, like, I don't feel like I'm using my music brain any different than I use my science brain. The lab was about creativity. It was so fun. It was like playing in a sandbox. And singing is the same way. And I need to know a little bit of the technical, a little bit of the science, a little bit of the lab techniques. And then I take those lab techniques and create. And then I take the vocal techniques and create. So I think musicians, there's a reason why there's so many doctor scientists musicians. You know, it's funny how it hasn't gone the other way, but it is super common. I have two famous scientists in my vocal performance class who are top level singers um, because they know that it's a similar thinking pattern. But I think musicians don't know the other way, that they will be good scientists because they're they're trained for that. You're trained for technical exploration and then creative overlay. How so I think all, oh, go ahead. No, please finish. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I think all musicians could be great scientists. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how can people find you to learn more? <gasps> oh, no, I am so bad. I am still working on a website. I mean, right now it's Facebook. I have a pedagogue page. I have my personal page, and I have a journal club. If anyone likes to write, it's called Minding the Gap, and it's bridging neuroscience and basic science papers with vocal pedagogy, and so I'll go through figures and explain that. I'm on Twitter a lot. That's where a lot of my science world is. Yeah. So, but I'll get a website soon, but I, I love teaching my studio. I have room. I give lectures a lot in different places in the UK, particularly for some reason. And so they're on the web and things well, like that. Do you want to give out an email or something so that if anyone wants you to present, they can reach you? Yes, please, please. My email is, it's a joke, right? It's Bell's Canto, B E L L S. <laughs> Like Bell's Palsy, right. but Bell's Palsy. Yeah, Bell's Canto at gmail.com. Heidi Moss yeah. Erickson, thank you so much, <gasps> not only for letting me talk thank to you, but for letting me challenge you like that. I really, I knew you could take it. And I, it was worth I it. I love it. I love it. To drag out the, the good stuff, because we're on the yeah. same page with all of this. And I really enjoyed it very much. No, me too. And I, I think we should all be open to dialogue and being challenged. And there's not one right path and one right answer. And it changes. And I appreciate you challenging me. And you taught me a lot about, you know, I took it for granted that other instrumentalists had it easy with sheet music, but that's not the case. So. <laughs> well, thank, not at all. We could talk about that for an hour. Oh, yeah. That could be a whole other thing. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thanks thank for letting you. me travel. My pleasure. And thank you all for watching. As always, we really appreciate your tuning in. If you're enjoying these videos, please like them. We want more and more people to know about this interview with Heidi and with the other Sopranos we've talked to, Miss Jen Litwin, uh, Miss Blake Hill, and all the others. We, we recently had a conversation with Billy Joel's old drummer. You've got to check these videos out. Please, please check us out. Um, you can find me at www.acole.net, acole.net. You can get access to the video page. And you can reach me at the Willow School at Willow Music. That's uh, willowschoolga.com. You can find my email and you can reach me easily there. Thank you very much, folks. We will see you next time.